My name is Molly Linhart, and as president of the Management Consulting Association, I am pleased to introduce and welcome the U.S. Chairman and Senior Partner of PwC, Bob Moritz, to the UCLA Anderson School of Management. As many of you know, PwC is one of the largest professional services firms in the world focused on audit and assurance, tax, and consulting services. PwC is also one of the largest employers of Anderson graduates. According to the 2014 UCLA Anderson Employment Report, PwC hired over 15 students for internship and full-time positions in that year. As the interest in consulting and advisory careers continues to expand across the Anderson student body, so too does the interest in PwC, a firm that students find attractive for its global reach and fabulous reputation. Bob Moritz has had a front row seat in watching PwC emerge into the professional services conglomerate it is today. He joined PwC back in 1985 and became a partner in 1995. From 1998 to 2001, he served as the Metro Regional Financial Services Leader. And from 2001 to 2004, he led the US firm's financial services audit and business advisory practice before becoming the managing partner of the New York office and Metro region and subsequently the assurance leader of the U.S. firm. Bob Moritz is currently the chairman and senior partner of the U.S. firm of PwC and is serving his second four-year term in that role. He is also a member of the PwC Global Network Leadership Team, which includes the senior partners from the network's four largest territories. We are very lucky to have Bob Moritz here today, so please join me again in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone, including our PwC colleagues, for coming here today. And of course, thank you, Bob Marks. Absolutely. And uh, what we are going to be doing, and you can start this already, is we're going to be asking you to submit questions also through Twitter or live. Uh, and the hashtag is hashtag Ask Marts, I think. Yes. It is. <laughs> um, yeah, hashtag Ask Marts. So if you want to start now, and I'll use those as we go through. And many of the questions that I'm going to ask Bob are already um, submitted by some of our faculty and staff and students. So you might recognize some of those. So let's start, first of all, um, beyond thanking you for being here, given your role, and for hiring our brilliant students, <laughs> which we think is a great thing for our students, but also wonderful for PwC. The question is, how do you create one PwC with the magnitude of your firm. You're hiring about 8,000 a year, over 200,000 uh, individuals who work for PwC globally, 35 billion in revenue. This is a major tanker that you're leading. How do you create a unified approach? It's like any other <clears throat> change management program, especially over the last six years or so when you think about the enormous growth that we've had, and it's all been in reaction to the market demand, you've got to bring in the right skills and the right resources. And in order to do that, you've got to lay down some foundational elements of what the expectations of those people are, both in terms of the skills and competencies, but also the behaviors and the values in terms of how we should expect our people, no matter what business they're in, no matter where they may live, no matter what sector they may serve, to have similarities. And those similarities go back to some basic core behaviors of the importance of relationships. It goes back to the importance of teamwork. It goes back to the values associated with bringing value to everything we do in the communities that we, uh, we operate in, the clients that we serve, or otherwise. So to do that, you've got to think about the entirety of the change management needed to bring it to life. First, what's the messaging in the top? If we're messaging we're a portfolio company, you're not going to bring the place together as one firm. So you have to message that there's an integration and there's a business need for doing it. You've got a role model when that comes together. You've got to make sure your training problems, are, your training programs are bringing together skills and resources and the ability to people work together. You've got to actually create formal and informal networks for people to interact and get to know one another and actually be able to work as a team collectively. And you've got to then ultimately have policies, procedures, and ultimately compensation measures to reinforce the right behavior and when necessary actually detract from the wrong behavior. So all of those things, Judy, are really important in setting the cultural expectation. Now, I will say one last thing, which is evident in your question. Some of our competitors 
actually don't have that one firm mindset. So some may say, I want to operate a business over here and a business over here, which we think is competitively not the right thing to do when you look at the demands that the market has on us to bring the best value, the best ideas, no matter what organizational construct you put in place. We've seen two or three examples where some of our competitors have actually pitched a piece of work with two different business units, but some from the same company. I'm happy to have that problem every day because it gives us an opportunity to win, but for them to compete against ourselves makes no sense to us intuitively, and that's the history of the firm because that's what the market expects when you look at the long-term trends. So speaking of the long-term trends, let's look at what changes in recent years have happened that you've noticed in the mix of services that your clients are needing. How has that morphed or evolved? So over the last um, 10 or 12 years, there's been three major shifts that have happened. First, the audit profession on a standalone basis had a major shift when the new rules and regulations came across it. You could not sell or bring other services to an audit client to preserve your independence. So that was a major shift because any of the professional service firm, PwC included in that, probably had 70% of their revenue streams coming from those audit clients. So the challenge at that point in time, way back when, was to actually quickly shift and say your audit business has to remain independent and bring excellent value to the investors, to the boards and the management teams, while at the same time taking that distribution channel and bringing into a new client segmentation. So in this case, you're auditing 35% of the marketplace, which drove at the time 80, 75 to 80% of your revenues, 35% over here, now you've got to figure out a way to attack the 65% over here that you don't do audits on. Major shift and cultural change to bring that one firm to bear, to actually take advantage of that opportunity. Second, the so shift... That, so, so that was more than a structural change? More than a structural change. That was a regulatory change that drove a behavioral change that actually required structural change and conflicts of interest and other things to be put in place from a policy procedure as well. Absolutely. Now go to then the second major shift. The second major shift is that every organization now is operating in a global environment. The smallest company in Cincinnati is operating somehow globally, either through how they're actually going through a supply chain scenario that leverages resources from anywhere else around the world, from a back office that may be functioning digitally from somewhere else, or for that matter, selling on an internet basis, on a digital basis, to customers on a worldwide perspective that actually they're limited to from their physical presence to just the office in Cincinnati. So getting us to react to and add value to how do you get CEOs and board members to understand what markets to be in, where to invest, how to invest, how to operate is really important from a strategy perspective and from an execution perspective. The third major shift, which is most recently, and this comes out of our global CEO survey, we do a survey every year. We launch it at Davos. It's about 1,700 different CEOs, size of companies, sectors, geographic reach. You are now seeing CEOs saying, I am unable and ill-equipped to deal with the amount of change that's happening from a disruptive perspective. And those are coming from the combination of disruption from competitors and maybe non-traditional competitors, disruption from activists, disruption from individual technologists and the like. I am inalienable, enable, and illegible to actually react to how many different rules and regulations are coming in around the world and managing that complexity and the size of change. And oh, by the way, thinking about social, mobile, analytics, cloud computing technologies, huge implication. So how do I operate in that world as an organization as well as a leader? And let me give you one very specific example to bring this to life. Former CEO of Kraft would tell you, Understanding how to manage a brand is much different today than it was a couple of years ago. And here's the example he gives. A couple of years ago, they actually produced Capri Suns. He brings the Capri, uh, mom and dad bring a Capri Sun on the soccer field when their kids are playing. By chance, it got, picked, it got punctured. There's a small little hole in the bag. There's a little bit of mold around the bag. Typically, a customer, a consumer, would call up and say, I have a problem. What are you going to do about it? They would traditionally fix that problem by saying, I'm really sorry, it's unfortunate that it happened, I'll give you a case a month for life. What happens today in that world? Somebody takes a picture, downloads it, puts it on Instagram, 10 million hits, it's a 5% impact on market cap. <laughs> but that is true, that's the reality of the world we're now living in. So CEOs are trying to figure out what to do in that regard. Now let's go to the personal side. A CEO saying something at a small, intimate, knowledge-based organization 
and actually in a, in a, with a microphone on, they walk off the stage. Literally, whatever was said is now known in another country around the world. No microphones here. I see two of them. I'm a little worried. <laughs> More importantly, it is the, the device that you're holding in your hand or in your pocket right now that somebody's texting somebody else or tweeting something in terms of what Bob or Susan said. So now your question is how to interact in that world. And conversely, anybody can interpret that. So now how do you have thick skin to decide what to engage on and what not to engage in? So those three big trends, like I said, sort of the service offerings that are needed, structural change, globalization, and now the pace of change is usually important in terms of how clients are struggling and therefore the needs they have from a professional services firm. And now look forward, not just in the rear view mirror, where do you anticipate that mix of services to be um, really disruptive in the future? So going and, and forward... And the question after that will be how do you change your talent mix? Yeah, so going forward we will end up having a lot of opportunities to focus on two strategic issues, just to give you context again before going to the specifics. In the last 150 years, we've been an assurance organization, an organ organization, that provided assurance over a set of financials to allow companies to actually transact in the marketplace and investors to invest. Tomorrow, today, it is how do you enable better trust regardless? Financial statements are just one of those, but trust is hugely important, as well as solve big, important, complex problems. What will that require? The mix of business and the mix of skills will be much different. So going forward, today our mix of business is probably 35 40% audit. It's maybe 30% tax, the remaining 30% on the consulting side of the equation. That mix will change, but here's what's going to remain the same. You'll still be in those businesses. They'll actually be more need to cut across. So what skills do I need? I need more strategists to think about what markets to be in. I need more global people to be operating because the old world that's developed has been based upon a lot of Western thinking, particularly the last couple of decades, Thinking about it from a Muslim perspective, thinking about it from an Asian perspective, thinking about it from a Hindu perspective is going to be hugely important. And the last big skill set that's really going to be important is technologists that understand operating in a cloud-based environment where data and the things that are all connected is really impactful from what you do, the services you provide, how you interact with one another, how people purchase, how they behave, et cetera. That'll be needed in every single one of our businesses. So those are the big trends we're focused on. Those are the kind of skill sets we're going to look for. And what, is, what are the implications for us? Global strategy, technology. We've said Here as a, as a learning. Institute. So we've said as a, a, a framework to think about the skill sets that we're looking for, we need great technical acumen. No surprise, you want to be deep in a couple areas, but you want to be broad across a bunch of others. You've got to understand business and set of how business interacts today. So there's a beyond technical. So business acumen, hugely important. Third is global acumen. Understanding how the Chinese think about a particular challenge with a long-term mindset is much different than a Western mindset. Thinking about it from an Indian perspective, much different. Thinking about it from an African perspective, much different. You've got to understand so the global nature of how to interact with people, either as a consumer or a future employee. Relationships, hugely important. And last but not least is leadership and your ability to operate in these ambiguous type of worlds that are out there right now. So those are the five frameworks. Now go within them. On the technical side, we will look for people that understand technology better. You've grown up with it. It's fantastic. Leverage it. It's a huge asset. People are dying for those skills to the extent you've got them. And it's not just for the consulting people. It's for everybody. Today, CEOs would say, I am most worried about the speed and changes caused by disruption from technology. As a result, I feel today I'm ill-equipped to go after that. My IT professionals can't even keep up. Never, no one can I. That creates big opportunities for you all to come in from a bottoms-up perspective with your knowledge to teach others. We within PwC actually use reverse mentoring. My more senior people need a lot of help. The reverse mentoring from you all to teach how to do those things. What's the latest app i got to buy or build or rent? Hugely important. How do I think about the latest data that's necessary to make it happen? Your connections and connections globally, hugely beneficial, that will actually allow for you to be more successful than your predecessors before you. Uh, your CEO survey, the most recent one, talked about the fact that something like 50% of the CEOs responded that one of their biggest preoccupations is the skill gap. Of these 8,000 people that you hire a year, what do you wish you had more of? Cloud-based technologists. So the actual stat is we ask a question of our 
CEOs in this survey, can you achieve the strategic objectives you set in the next three years? If not, what's getting in the way? Over 70% responded, I, I don't feel equipped to actually achieve them because I don't have the right talent. And it's the right talent at a senior level to op operate in a very fast-paced world and transform their businesses, as well as the masses of talent that are needed. And this goes to the number of engineers to Caterpillar. It goes to the number of digital marketing people that an IPG has. It goes to the new skills to operate in a more fast-paced, disruptive type of world. So to your point, cloud technology disruption is going to be hugely important. And the second skill set we're going to be looking for is people to be able to demonstrate agility because the business today will not be the business tomorrow. It is going to change rapidly over time. So I'm looking for a core fundamental, which is demonstration of agility and being able to navigate the gray zone and operate successfully doing one thing one day and a totally different thing the next day. Let's just switch a little bit and, and see how you practice what you consult, and that is the merger that you uh, just executed last year with Booz Allen, Booz and Company, sorry, I'm dating myself, with <laughs> Booz and Company. Uh, what were the strategic advantages, and how did you use the tools that you consult along to create a successful merger? So just to give you a little bit of perspective on why we did the transaction, when we've tested the marketplace, coming back to the needs of a CEO and a board, them articulating how do I do strategy through execution, not just the execution is usually important. And we did not have critical mass or reputation in the strategy space to compete against a McKinsey, a BCG, a Bain. So that's why it was important to go actually get these skill sets and do the acquisition. We had a choice now, just like we advise other companies, how do you want to think about acquiring those skills? You could do it by individual organic hiring. You can do it by a series of team grabs and be disruptive in the marketplace. You can do it by a joint venture. You can do it by an acquisition. And we thought the pace of change was so big that we had to go to an acquisition. Once we decided on an acquisition, then it was to test the marketplace and see what was the right place to actually do. And again, similar to how we advise our clients, think about does it fit strategy? Does it fit your culture? Will it be additive to what you're trying to accomplish and consistent with it? And then what's the chances of success on an integrated basis? So we landed on Booz and Company to go through the exercise. All the consulting firms today as a standalone consulting firm are looking to have enough scale. And for that matter, they're trying to get into the execution phase because clients are looking for them to do more as they streamline and leverage procurement to get more out of it. So I will argue that many of the consulting firms are also going to be doing the same thing that the other larger professional services firms will do. So once you made that transaction, it gave you great benefit. It gave you scale. It gave us reach in the emerging markets. Booz and companies um, practice within the Middle East. Again, emerging market to pay particular attention to was fantastic. Had a better brand than, than McKinsey does in the Middle East. So it was great to catapult us on a professional services basis in a much bigger place. And similarly, some of the resources they had in the emerging markets, which we wanted to focus on the emerging, not the developed, because you can recruit resources in the developed. We need to get inorganic activity to go after the emerging markets was usually important. Then you go to the last piece, which is, again, practice what you preach. How do you have a disciplined approach around inter integration? To Dis one PwC. To one PwC. So you had to actually say, OK, how do we actually bring the best of the resources together? And here is my criteria for thinking about this. A successful transaction meant one plus one equals three. Their revenues, our revenues, their brand, our brand combined together gives you a better brand than just the additive of one plus one equals two. Their leadership team became part of the combined leadership team. Their people ended up being as successful and having promotional opportunities. We adopted some of their policies and procedures, so we were creating something new, not necessarily just assimilating them into PwC. And last but not least, the distribution channel of what they did previously when they were a strategy only firm actually allowed for you to do a dollar revenue of strategy, three to four dollars of execution. So they needed to understand what PwC did, and we needed to understand what they did. And having a discipline around how do you make that come to life was usually important. Most mergers, most acquisitions fail because the operational discipline isn't there to go after it. And that goes to operational and capturing the ROI. But more importantly, to your point now, is cultural interaction and sustainability of the business so you can actually ensure that the longevity and the success is there. 
So what will be a metric of success, both in terms of the business side as well as the cultural side, and when? So measures of success, I would say, will be threefold. One will be the brand that the new organization brings, and that will be determined by outsiders, not by us. And you have a separate brand. You have Strategy N. We have Strategy N right now, and we believe that's important so people understand we are in the strategy space because the brand of PwC was not known as being in the strategy space. So having both is super important mm -hmm. as we actually allow for ourselves to enhance that. We use outsiders to measure that. So we actually get reviewed by the analyst community and the like. So understanding that would be really important. Number two will actually be then the combination of the individual ability to recruit on campus, right? So the brand on campus here in terms of in the schools that are super important will be important to be a leading indicator, say, do people get it? Is PwC a viable option for them? And as a result, that'll be the telltale sign in terms of the sustainability. Because that is usually important because we're a people business, we're driven by it. So one of our key metrics, regardless of an acquisition or otherwise, is all around people. Can I just ask a question there? Yeah. Are you recruiting in separately to strategy end from, for example, the Anderson MBA program? So we are recruiting, we've combined our strategy group from PwC Legacy with strategy end and put it all into the strategy end group. So how many here are going to strategy end? So we end? have about 15 or 20 that are coming into the group. Into strategy end? Yeah. And you consider it strategy end as opposed to PwC? Yep. What do you guys think? They're not going to say. Why not? <laughs> of course. So uh, it's important to understand that our consulting business is four major competencies. Strategy is one piece of that, of which that is sent branded separately. Again, get that recognition and move that forward. And then the last metric is going to be, are we able to outperform the competition? And that's the competition of today, but I'm equally focused on what's the future competition that's coming our way. I firmly believe in a professional services firm. I've got to watch more carefully what's happening at um, Google, TCS, et cetera, as much as I have to focus on what happens at a Deloitte or a McKinsey today, based upon the disruption that's going to happen come from those new organizations. Yes. Uh, You've written also about millennials. Bob writes a lot, and uh, it, it's, it's fascinating to see the range of, of topics he, he addresses. And one of the, the important issues that you've tackled is employment of millennials, because I think you've estimated that 80% of PwC's workforce next year is going to be comprised right. of millennials taking over. So how have you adjusted the, the nature of the employment relationship, the culture, the policies, to be attractive to that very critical talent resource? We spent a ton of time interacting with our employee base. And I, when I came into the role, took a mindset that it's got to be bottoms up rather than tops down in terms of how we lead the place, change the place, transform the place. And to give you a stat, the average age of our place in the States is about 28. And the average age in our place worldwide is about 27 and a half. So it is a next-gen millennial place. As a result, you've got to think differently, act differently, and put different policies and procedures in place. So we did a number of different studies for a millennial group to say, what is the most important thing? Because I truly believe if you can be that talent magnet, you'll have no problem having the diversification necessary to bring the best ideas to the marketplace to serve our clientele. So the five big things that you all are telling us is, I want maximum flexibility. I want to be able to work any place, any time, anywhere. It does not matter. I don't need to be limited to my office. And that allows me to manage work and life as best I possibly can. Number two. OK, and, and I'll ask you how you've adjusted afterwards. I'll come back to that in a sec, because mm -hmm. number two ties to it. Number two, I've got to have the best in class technology. You grew up with technologies that are much different than the baby boomers did. You use that much differently than the baby boomers did. We've got to create that environment. And oh, by the way, the technology allows for the flexibility because you've got enough connectivity to allow for that to bring together. So in the case of flexibility, to your point, we've actually put contests in place and programs in place to ensure flexibility. Before every project starts, we want the teams to get together to say, OK, every person on the team what is it you want in terms of flexibility? So if you need to leave you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 o'clock to go do X, or if you need to come in because you want to hit the gym you know, every morning, or if you've got somebody you've got to take care of from a family situation, put it on the table, have the right culture to have that dialogue, and the collective team will help make that come to life. 
in return, you're going to have to give a little bit too because, Judy, you're going to want to leave, and I may have to cover your back in the professional services world. So we put policies and procedures to create that environment, and then we're measuring that in the surveys that we do, and we're making sure that that gets measured team by team in our feedback process to then adjust compensation for the leaders of those various teams. So flexibility, technology, community service, corporate responsibility, the ability for you to give back, the ability for you to have a higher sense of purpose above and beyond what you do in, in day in and day out is hugely important. Now again, people say, well, is that really different than the baby boomers? I will tell you, it's not. We've studied this from an academic perspective. It's not much different, but if people at a next gen level, those born after 1980, don't see it, they're more likely to leave. Whereas a baby boomer wants the time to do that too, but they're more likely to stay. Take it on the other side of the equation. If you end up participating in a corporate responsibility that aligns with your objectives and the firm's objectives, you're likely to stay with us about a year and a half or two years longer because our values are aligned. So we give now policy change. We've changed to give people the opportunity to give back we put financial incentives in place. We've turned contests in place to create the right environment for people to give back in causes that are particular to PwC and then give you the opportunity to the causes that are particular to you individually. The, the other two things I want to make sure are focused on feedback. Real-time feedback, hugely important. There's a big myth, big myth that people don't want to interact with one another because they're leveraging technology. Call BS on that one. You want as much face-to-face -face feedback as everybody else does, so we cannot allow for that myth to stand. And last but not least is engagement. You want to be engaged. And in fact, there's another statistical study which I love to quote. If you're more engaged, there's 75% more productivity. Now, people assume that's more hours. It's not. It's better outcomes. What does it take to be engaged? I understand the strategy. I'm participating in the strategy. I feel like I'm being coached in the strategy. I feel like I'm rewarded in the strategy. And I believe the strategy allows me to achieve things personally. I believe it allows the company to achieve its objectives professionally. And I believe it allows us to do a higher sense of purpose and obligation back to community. And if you can hit those kind of things, that's important. So what do we do? Engage with everybody. We have town hall meetings. We ask them to help with the business objectives. We did a contest recently, a couple of years ago, which was, what's the next $100 million idea for PwC? Everybody's involved. And in that, Bring it in. We had 800 ideas. We had the whole firm vote. We did a little bit of innovation and pop culture together. Vote on the 800 ideas. The top 25 ideas got a marketing person, a finance person, and a retired partner to help develop the ideas. The firm then voted on the 25 in an American Idol type of format. The five pitched live to the leadership team. They basically ended up going out and saying, OK, here's the ideas. You got 15 minutes to pitch in a Shark Tank type environment. And we took those ideas and ran with it. The winner got the 100,000 bucks. The reality was what was really interesting, it wasn't the ideas. The ideas were great, and we're implementing those, but 80% of the firm got engaged. We gave people, we gave the teams money to reward the best coaches because we wanted the whole firm to coach them. That's the kind of crowdsourcing environment you want to create that will be more beneficial and more likable than the next-gen Malins. The more we can do that, the more successful they are, the more successful we are, the better we are from a brand perspective. It's very interesting on, on this crowdsourcing of fundamental strategy. Uh, I think that study on millennials also pointed out that millennials actually like more frequent performance feedback, yes. not less frequent. Uh, if you're not talking, baby boomers found that if you talk to your boss, you're in trouble. Uh, millennials would say, if I'm not talking to the boss, I'm in trouble. So more feedback on a regular basis is really important, and it's in the game feedback real time. Don't wait for the project or the game to be over. That's way too late. So culturally now, to your point around what do you do, inside the organization, you've got to get the mindset to actually change. And it's not those that are receiving the feedback. It's actually those that are giving it. And we want to create the environment that it's safe to do that. It's not threatening. It's actually constructive criticism for future improvement but not a negative to the evaluation process. Um, I'm reminding you, hashtag Ask Moritz, M-O-R-I-T-Z, one word, Ask Moritz. Um, and, and I'm going to get to your questions in, in, in just a moment, and some of them are embedded in mine. Uh, I, I'm going to stick with the, the notion of how do you appeal to the workforce that you need and really talk about uh, a gender and attracting and retaining women 
and underrepresented minorities. What have you learned? What are you doing? You cannot, I've learned you cannot generalize this concept of diversification and inclusiveness. Um, each grouping, to generalize for a second, has its own unique challenges and opportunities, and you've got to be very detailed in the tailoring of what to do about it. Um, women coming in to the workforce off a campus have a different series of challenges than a male does. A black or Latino coming into a workforce, a totally different set of challenges. So at PwC, and I'm trying to argue more globally, not within PwC, but outside of PwC, but across governments, communities, and the business community, getting into a greater level of granularity to really solve the problems is really important. So you have to actually create flexibility so it's not a one-size-fits-all. You have to create an opportunity for people to be candid about what they want and what their issues are. Um, you've got to create programs. Um, Sheryl Sandberg went out with her book on Lean In for women, and I wrote a blog that basically said it's great for women to lean in, but if the corporates don't lean in, they fall over. And as a result, the corporates have to do more to create the ability for them to lean into the opportunities and then be successful. And lean in for a corporate means you do have to have a flexible environment to be able to work part-time or whatever the case may be. It does mean you need programs to allow for them to be successful. It does mean that you actually have to do some things that might be unnatural. Um, and what I mean by that is, and we were talking about it, Judy, earlier, um, you see people call it unconscious, you call it subconscious biases that are in an evaluation process when people perhaps leave from maternity leave. Out of sight, out of mind. A top performer, out of sight, out of mind, all of a sudden becomes an average performer. But nothing's changed. So from a policy perspective, we actually said, if anybody leaves to go on maternity leave, you're going to retain your rating for a year or two so there isn't this sub or unconscious bias just because you've been out of the workforce. You didn't change your performance because just you left for a little while. We also put you into a separate class to be evaluated if you're on a part-time basis because you had to have this. The other thing we've learned is if you're going to want to make change, you actually have to put the personal sacrifice to make it happen. Mentorship is one thing. Sponsorship is another. Spot mentorship is great advice in an office or over a lunch conversation. Sponsorship is when somebody puts forth personal capital to ensure your better success. So we're all about the sponsorship concepts. I'll give you a good example. We've got a lot of large consulting clients where you're interacting with, unfortunately, just because of where we're at, a lot of male CEOs, male board members. When we talk about who the next engagement partner is going to be to manage that big relationship and be in the boardroom with them or otherwise, there's probably a bias towards I want somebody who looks like me who's been really experienced. And I can tell you one example where I literally had to sit down with the CEO, sit down with the board member, say, I understand what you may think you want, but I have got a great person who is a female that is fantastic. You need to either trust me because I know diversity is important to you. It's important to me. Collectively, let's get this woman in this job. And don't let the other natural forces and behaviors get in the way of doing it. This is your decision and my decision. Let's make it happen. And now four of the top 10 accounts within PwC are managed by women. But it's been the hand-to-hand -hand combat to make that happen. Not that they couldn't do it that are on their own, but we want to make it faster. So you've got to get the personal capital to actually go at that kind of stuff. So we've learned a lot. The last thing I will say on this topic, unless you want to go elsewhere or take questions on it, business community, the communities, and politicians got to come together on this issue. We're taking these conversations to other corporates. We're talking to it at various organizations. We're talking to it at cities. Just met with the people in Detroit over the last two days. We did a session in St. Louis, a session in Cleveland, a session in Philadelphia. Diversity helps for better ideas and better advice. It helps with economic improvement in a location. And if politicians and the business community and the Chambers of Commerce can focus on that more so, there'll be more economic growth. And I think that's important for this country as well. It, it does start very early. And it takes every piece of our value chain starting from K right. to 12, to universities, to the corporate world. Um, I'll ask you just a couple of leadership questions and, um, and maybe a little bit on, on your starting point in your career, which is accounting. Uh, one of our professors asked if you would 
tell us about the most recent leadership lesson you've learned. We're in, uh, you're constantly learning, I'm sure you're constantly evolving. What's a, what's a recent leadership lesson you've learned? If you want change, you've got to be willing to put forth the personal sacrifice to bring it to the table. And you cannot assume 100% are going to get it. And nor should you expect you need 100% to do it. So let me bring it to life. Um, there's a, a number of changes that we made within PwC recently around our governance mechanisms and the way the partnership comes together. Um, I thought intuitively some of these things made natural sense to me, but I spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with board members trying to get them to understand the rationale behind the thinking, the need to move and move with speed, and how to manage the risks, because everybody's worried about risks on the other end and the, the uncertainty. And with no certainty, there's an assumption that it's bad or it can go wrong. So you really have to spend a lot of personal capital to actually have those kind of conversations. Um, ideally, you'd love to be able to say, I've got the majority, go. You'd love to say, I've got 100%. Um, you're never going to get it. You're never going to please everybody. And as a result of that, you've got to have thick skin and say, you know what? We'll agree to disagree and let's move on. Sounds like a university environment. Yeah, it is a university. <laughs> it's a political environment, it's a university environment, and it's a corporate environment. It happens more than you think. Um, so the getting the change management organized in the right way is important. You want any change, what typically happens is 10 to 20% of the people will get it intuitively. 5, 10, 15% of people will never get it. Don't spend any time there. It's the 60 some odd percent that are uncertain and are waiting to be led, get your 10 to 20% to help lead that change. And that's usually important. The thing I would say that's different than a couple of years ago in that is you have to move with more speed. The world's moving too fast, and if you are not moving as fast, you are falling behind. So moving with speed is important. If no speed, no action. If no action, you're going to be out of business relatively soon. Here's a Twitter question from Joey Damaris. Joey? Here? Uh, Joey's asking, talk about a time when you got it wrong and how you rebounded from it. Oh, I get it wrong a lot of times. Um, <laughs> um, Thank you. So, great question. Um, I can think of an example where I got and put a wrong leader in a, in a position. Um, and I took the change too far. I was trying to bring a new wave of thinking into this particular business unit. Um, that was outside the norm, and what I learned was I didn't do enough pre-work to allow for their entry and their sustainability to be successful. You had to very carefully think about when you interject and when you don't, because uh, you want to give people to be a chance to be successful. You want to give them a little bit of leash to, to learn it on their own without being too overbearing, and you definitely have to have your tentacles in the place to know when things are working or when they're not. You're going to have to admit failures, um, and you just got to move on from them, but make sure you learn from them. And to me, this one particular thing, it, what, what learned was two things. One was I didn't do enough pre-work to get the rest of the team to be supportive of this person and the rationale behind it, and didn't give them enough experience and exposure to make that entry point really natural. So it became a lot, heck of a lot easier in terms of their entryway. And on the back end, making sure that they exit in a graceful way and do something else so they're not negatively positioned in terms of the next role I want to give them. So that's one small example, but a lot of lessons in learning that. Look, I would tell you, we just did a book on the successes of billionaires. Most billionaires have failed more than they have succeeded. But they've learned a lot. They've acknowledged those failures. You are learning all the time. If you don't think you're learning all the time, I will tell you, you're not going to be around for a very long time and be successful. Um, your choice is take all the data points and then figure out what you do differently and when you do it and how you do it. And that's going to be very personal to you, but don't stop the learning and the observing along the way. And don't stop trying and taking yeah. risks. Look, t today's world, like I said earlier, is moving way too fast. If you're not willing to experiment more and try some things and fail and try it again in a different way, again, you're not going to disrupt yourselves. If you don't disrupt yourself, somebody else is coming at you. Either an activist or another competitor is going to do it to you. Uh, a couple of questions just on accounting, and then we'll certainly go to your questions. Uh, what is it now, what, 12 years since Sarbanes-Oxley was passed? Yes. Uh, 
what have been the lasting effects, except perhaps increasing your business? <laughs> so Sarbanes required a lot of things. But in summary, there were sort of three or four major things it required. It required the CFOs and the CEOs to certify that the controls around their business were appropriate. The second thing it did, it actually allowed for the lawmakers and the enforcement agencies to go after senior executives in a more thoughtful and proactive way to say where there's culpability. And last but not least, it required organizations to do a much better job of thinking about their control environment and their policies and procedures to minimize the risk of fraud or inappropriate behavior or results that would lead in a negative position for the investor or perhaps even the, um, the taxpayer. So I would say the implications are as follows. For the organizations that were doing it really well previously, there was no change. There really wasn't. Um, there may be a little bit of process improvement, but it was a 5 to 10% incremental change that happened on those large organizations that were doing it really well. Now, I'll come back to the story in a second. For those that weren't doing it well, it was a major cost. And Kenley was required. So I'll go to the financial crisis. Um, I can tell you, when I was, I was leading the financial services practice, and I had an opportunity to do that, so I knew a lot of players on Wall Street. When you sat down with the CEOs, at the time the financial crisis was happening, or the board members, or the management teams, you had a really good sense of who had a handle on the details to know what risks they really had. And those organizations that knew it and deputized their place well to say, let's make sure we do the right things, let's make sure we get the right data, let's make sure we help one another to not to go astray, those were the companies that today ended up being successful. The companies that were not successful didn't have the right escalation processes of weather problems. They didn't have the right control mechanisms in place. They didn't have the right enterprise systems to actually give them a sense of what the right risk management was. And you could tell walking in these places where it was there. So I would tell you, Judy, I think it was positive because it brought everybody up. What's interesting is the amount of financial reporting fraud actually reduced to a minimum. It did require boards to spend more time in that place. So there was a fundamental change there regardless because the boards were not spending a lot of time in that place. The challenge is now how do you strike the right balance? Because with any new regulation, sometimes it wanes away. Sometimes it gets newly interpreted. When people talk about regulation, there's three issues to think about. What is what's the new rule? How do I comply with it? Second is what's the new rules that the policymakers want that's not yet concluded on? And a lot of the banking industry, for example, has that issue today. And then the third thing that's really important is what are the old rules newly interpreted by somebody with a different mindset. And sometimes that mindset goes to the politicians and the stakeholder community being the taxpayers that maybe what was accepted in the past is no longer appropriate in the future. And the new rules haven't been, or the old rules haven't been changed, so people are just interpreting them differently. That's probably the biggest issue corporates have today, is keeping up with the interpretation of new rules because of the world environment that's out there. And that's what's caused the mistrust issue as quickly as it has. And do you, would you attribute to Sarbanes-Oxley and just the shock factor of an Arthur Anderson the fact that we now really don't have hardly any accounting scandals? Um, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make that assumption yet. Um, I do think you're going to, um, you've definitely had the auditing firms do more, you had the regulators come in and do more. You've definitely had the corporates do more. You've had the boards do more. You've had the investing community do more. Um, but don't be surprised if there is more stuff happening out there. You know, and then the question is, are we doing enough to find it and root it out at a relatively early stage so it doesn't become a bigger problem? Attributable to cyber issues? I'm, Could I'm be not... anything. So you know, if you think about today, what's interesting is you look at the economics today. We're in a low growth environment. And that's going to be there for a while on a global scale basis. So you're talking about GDP growth of you know, 2.5% here in the States and a worldwide basis, it's a problem. The valuations in some of the businesses right now are extremely high. So the search for revenue and the search for structured products to create some opportunities for enhanced yield, that pressure's there. What typically happens when you have these big problems that were out there with the world cons and the Enrons, the fraud started small, it got bigger and bigger, Someone said, I can fix the problem. I don't want to give it away. There's a little bit of self-preservation in that. The problem is it's the rollover effect in terms of how it snowballs into something bigger. 
the challenge is how to root stuff out at the lower level and make sure it stays lower, or if it becomes bigger, it gets escalated really quickly to mitigate it as much as possible. Um, the way we talk about it sometimes here is that there's a defense in everybody else is doing it, so I better do it too, right. and that's how it snowballs. Yep. Any questions here? We've hit a lot of stuff on PwC. I'm happy to take any personal or professional questions, so fire away. And for the people at PwC, you know I'll answer anything and everything, so fire away, folks. Questions? You can go to the Twitter account, too. Uh, yeah, you can do that. I I'll ask a personal question. Sure. You've written about work-life balance. How do you manage that? So work-life balance is important to me. Diversity is important to me. And here's two reasons why, just so people understand it. Um, I was in Japan for three and a half years in the 90s. I was the minority without changing skin color. So that got me to, as best I possibly could, understand a little bit about what it means to be unfairly treated. Um, I went through a divorce, um, so I understood how to deal with, to the extent possible, um, a parent or a woman going through this, um, taking care of kids, how to leave at 4 o'clock, pick the kids up, do the homework, cook dinner, take care of them, put them in bed, and drop them off at school. That's why it's important to me. So how do I manage it today? There's two or three things that are important. I am religious on taking vacation. You've got to disconnect. And I make sure in the August time frame, I take a week and I actually do it with my extended family. It's probably less of a vacation than it is a family holiday because I invite my two sisters that are not as fortunate as me, my brother not as fortunate as me, all the kids, and ends up with 20 people in a rented house on a beach. That's, Fantastic time. That's work. But it is a lot of work. Like I said, it's not a vacation. It's a family holiday. Um, mm -hmm. I will then go with my other half with maybe one or two other couples for a long weekend. That's a vacation to disconnect. I'll do a ski trip once a year. What I find is if you are not at least disconnecting, you are always stressed, you're not able to think correctly, you got to step away from it. You also got to talk about this. People in my firm assume I work 24-7, and this goes back to flexibility. I may actually leave at 3 o'clock to go do something personally or just relax. I may have to get on a phone call at 10 o'clock to talk to Japan or China, and that's the flexibility. It allows me to do a lot of different things. So I'm a big enabler, just to give you a sense. I actually organize in my free time a lot of different groups I stay connected with. I have high school friends still that are not as fortunate. I've got college friends I'm still connected to. I've got work friends. I've got PwC friends. I've got client friends. I've got retirees I'm friends with. I'm a big enabler to create parties. So let's organize a Super Bowl party with the high school friends. Let's organize a guy's shopping trip. We've done this now for 22 years. Guy shopping trip around the holiday. We probably I thought do less. that was an oxymoron. Yeah, it is a lit. It's, it, it, it's probably more drinking and eating than it is shopping. But the reality yeah. is it's yeah. literally there's 10 of us from high school still that on a Friday, two weeks before the holiday season, we still do this. And mm -hmm. I organize the place and where we go. So you got to demonstrate it. you got to role model it. And from my seat, you got to talk about it as well because people assume you're working all the time. And if you're not role modeling flexibility and work-life flexibility, they don't believe they can have it either. Go ahead, go to the, and just introduce yourself, please. Sure. Hi, uh, thank you for being here. My name is Amir Ali Gassemipour. I'm at Femba 2017, also the president of Strategy and Operations Association here at UCLA Anderson. Uh, so you mentioned some interesting points. Um, my question was that as a, as a firm who's expanding the breadth of its practice through hiring specific talents for different areas, up and coming areas, uh, seems like this is one, one of the general areas that the firm is growing organically. So in the same way that you mentioned, you know, the operational discipline that you uh, employ to make sure the mergers are successful, what is the operational discipline to make sure this type of growth is, is successful? Yeah, so it's a great question. When you think about our business, we have put forth a premise that we will be a multi-competency professional services firm, and we've put forth some aspirational goals in terms of what markets we want to be in, what businesses we want to be in, and then put some governing mechanisms to say, how do we strike the right balance? Because if you're too heavily weighted in one country versus another, or one competency or business versus another, you end up losing that balanced portfolio. So we've got the same discipline around how we are investing. So when I put forth a strategy, We've got a, a board today that has the responsibility for overseeing that strategy as well as the investments we're making in it. So we've got a certain amount of money that we've allocated to the inorganic, and inorganic comes in three ways. It comes in the outright acquisitions, like the Booz and Company. 
It is joint ventures and alliances, because we are doing much more of those, particularly with technology companies today, as we think about some cloud computing and the expertise that we need there, data analytics skill and the like. And it comes from individual team grabs of people from our competitive landscape or from the corporate landscape. Um, we're hiring as many doctors today, sometimes as we are strategists. Why? Because we believe we've got to be in the healthcare space. You want to be in the healthcare space, you really should know it from the start of that supply chain. So what a doctor does on day one is really important to think about the supply chain of going from a doctor to a hospital to a medical device company to the, the, to the government agency and then to the insurer. And that particular work stream is hugely important. So investing in organic growth is equally as important. And going long on the resources there is equally important, as is the IP and buying IP associated with that. So there's a similar discipline about scaling up organically or inorganically and then the proportionality of the revenues that we expect to have out of certain businesses, sectors, competencies, and geographies going forward. I'll give you two examples. Um, today, in the financial services world, which is probably our largest sector, um, we have a huge, huge audit business, which actually is disproportionate and inappropriate to think about asset management as a class going forward. In the emerging markets, it's actually disproportionately non-audit. It's in the consulting space, which is going to be really important as you think about wealth creation, uh, income inequality, mechanisms by which the countries will manage that wealth creation and the consumer demographics that will drive the, the wealth, and then what we do about it and what kind of investable assets they have in class. So we're actually consciously maybe not going after the audits to allow for us to actually have the domination in the consulting space to actually advise CEOs, politicians, as well as government agencies to think about how do you think about wealth asset management and the creation around those things. So it is a country by country, business by business, sector by sector build up of then what the consumer needs. And that consumer is all stakeholders, not necessarily just the clientele. Any other questions here in person? Yes, go ahead to the microphone. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that to better serve your client, you need a workforce that thinks about strategies and um, have expertise in certain technologies such as cloud and big data. Right, so to, today that may be the trend. How do you position PwC, PwC to take advantage of future trends in technology? Yeah, so from a strategy perspective, we did this about two years ago. And we refresh it every three years. Four fundamental questions. How will you remain relevant? Where, to, in order to remain relevant, where will you grow and how will you invest? Where will you get the talent or IP to sustain that investment and the growth trajectory you need to be relevant? And then last but not least, how will you disrupt and not be disrupted? What we did two and a half years ago was we took about 40 people and we said, let's take an outside view in. So we went off and interviewed politicians, clients, regulators, academics on a worldwide basis. We gave them three months to start that project and then we called them a timeout. And we said, before you get to that, can we actually talk about the big trends that are happening right now that will be impactful over the next 20 years? So five trends we landed on. The concepts of shifting demographics. When you look at the growth rates of the consumers and the populations in India, China, Africa, Malaysia, Indonesia, et cetera, hugely important. The rise of the consumer and the, the definition of a middle class, not with a U.S. standard, by a global standard of having disposable income of more than 5,000 bucks has huge implications. An aging workforce of 46 years old on average in, in Japan versus a 28 in India has huge implications. So understanding demographic shifts, hugely important, and the implications from them. Second major trend, shifting capital markets. The last 100 years have been defined as the US and particularly you know, the New York and New York Stock Exchange as being the center of excellence for capital formulation and access to capital. Clearly not the case anymore. And in fact, if you go back hundreds of years, actually the center of economic excellence was actually in Asia. And it shifted west and now it's going back east. What are the implications of that? The third shift, the concept of urbanization. Many think about that concept from the, the perspective of Africa, China, India. Well, let's take the reverse. Um, upstate New York, um, Rust Belt, has had the exact opposite effect of that. 
You look at upstate New York, where I went to school, Syracuse, Rochester, Binghamton, et cetera, GE used to be there, Kodak used to be there, IBM used to be there, long gone. So that, that the opposite effect coming through it. Fourth big trend, resources. World needs 50% more water. The world needs 40% more food. It needs 30% more energy. You know what the number one risk that Google has is when they think about their EM process? It's energy. actually not talent. It's not actually electricity. It's actually supply chain related. They need access to fresh water to keep their servers cooled 24-7 on a worldwide basis. Now let's talk about the world order around resources. 98% of the world's water is in, ice, is in salt water form. The remaining 2% is actually in fresh water form, of which 75% is in glacier form. So what has to happen to think about access to fresh water? Now tie the concept of urbanization and resources together. Upstate New York sits right on top of the Great Lakes. They've got a huge asset, but you know what? No politicians talking about that access to fresh water. Now, Dow Chemical, Owens, Corning, and others have technologies to actually transform and leverage osmosis to think about salt water and fresh water. Huge opportunity in thinking about the West out here in terms of what the implications are there. And last but not least is the concept of technology. And this goes to two ways. The amount of data in the last two years is better than the, last, the amount of data that's been created in the last 150 years. The average number of devices that people have is seven. When you look at the combination of the thermostats in their house, the devices that are on their cars, the wearables that you have, or the multiple you know, phones or iPads, iPhones, Samsung devices, et cetera, that you have. Now combine a couple of these things. Economic growth in Africa will be huge, and they're going to leapfrog ahead of major transformational organizational constructs that we've had in the last 50 years. They're going to do it in a much different way. Countries in Africa are no longer as important as urbanizational cities in Africa, and that's where corporates are going. But they're going to leverage mobile technology to create infrastructure and not even require major infrastructure improvements to get there. And that's why their GDP growth is going to far outstrip Asia. Now let's go to another example. How do we remain relevant? A particular country leader called us in and said, I need to create a top 50 city in the world. What does it take to do it? Great strategic question. What do, recreation do I need? What logistics do I need? What moto, automotive do I need? What supply chains do I need? What security do I need? How do I leverage technology to do it? The next piece he's asked, how can I create a tax code to create the revenues to build it? And how can I create a tax code in order to sustain it? And can you provide me assurance to tell my taxpayer they're being treated fairly? So those trends you have to look at regularly then and say what skills and services you need. And those are the today and a little bit of the tomorrow continue to do those four-prong questions to get to then what has to happen. That's what all organizations should be thinking about. Those that are going to succeed are doing that and thinking about it in a totally disruptive 180 type of way. That was a fascinating answer. Thank you. I'm going, we, we've run out of time, but I have to ask this question if you can answer it in 30 seconds or less. You mentioned, and, and Brett actually asked a question about your methodologies for doing various studies. I'm going to focus on the billionaire study. What are the three things it takes? What's the common denominator to be a billionaire? <laughs> We're a business school. Risk-taking mindset. Totally disruptive mindset with no limitations on rules or regulation. And ability and willingness to fail and fail many times over. That represents sharing success, thinking fearlessly, and driving change, I think. That's, those are our key qualities of Anderson. Well, thank you so much. This was jam-packed information. Thank you.